Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Great Sports Podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with my very good friend, His Eminence, Father Richard Heilman, or Car- Cardinal Richard Heilman. Dark Cardinal, yeah. We can work the details out on that. Yeah, we'll get that down. We'll that out, All right. Yeah. And we got Father Chris LR with us tonight. We're going to be talking about many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the miracle of the Blessed Mother's image in the Eucharist that took place in San Francisco. And Father Chris was there. He's going to break it all down for us in detail. But before we do that, we want to begin everything with prayer. So, Father Hauman, that is your department. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the archangel, to defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the Amen. name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Father. <laughs> and of course, we always thank everybody out there who supports the U.S. Grace Force podcast. Your Support means everything to us. So we ask you to always like these these shows, these podcasts, these episodes, share them with others, subscribe to the channel. All those things do a lot to affect the algorithms, which makes it more recommended for more people to have a chance to hear these messages. And these are some pretty important messages, especially in the times that we're in. We also want to thank those of you who support us through the Patreon program. For those who would like to support us through the Patreon program, you can click the link in the description below. And a few dollars a month goes a very long way to help us continue to get this information out to as many people as possible. While we still have the time to do so, we want to make good use of all that we've been given by God and hope and pray that it reaches as many lives and souls as possible. So thank those of you who support us through the Patreon program. Don't forget also, if you're interested in getting some really cool U.S. Grace Force t-shirts and other gear, go out to our U.S. Grace Force official gear page. Link in the description below, and you can get some awesome t-shirts and all kinds of just great stuff out there. Hoodies, sweatshirts, all kinds of things that help, again, support the work that we do, but it also gets a great message out, again, to many, many people out there. Now, there's a message that came to the world through this event. So, Father Chris, thank you so much for joining us. This is very short notice, and you've been so gracious to jump on board quickly with us, but let's just get right to it because we can break this down. I mean, this entire episode, you were... You were in San Francisco, and this amazing event happened, this miracle, with the Eucharist and an image of Our Lady. Can you tell us what happened? Well, yeah. You know, I've I've always um, thought that a place in the epicenter where we need God, and especially Our Lady today, is San Francisco. Right. I've had a lot of close friends in the Oakland, Stockton, uh, San Francisco area, Brentwood area. And I it just always, it was very interesting because for years going out there and seeing the effect of the degradation of our culture and um, marriage and the dignity of life and just um, the pagan kind of embracing of the pagan life just really seemed to be um, uh, shown there in a deeper way. And I always thought, you know, pray for this part of our country, particularly San Francisco, because, you know, it's kind of the epicenter of the pride movement and whatnot. And when I was invited to go out there, I've had to cancel a lot of my events recently um, after being elected provincial superior. And I said, you know, I'm going to keep this one in San Francisco because we need the message so much. And sure enough, I went out there and they wanted me to speak on Mary and the Eucharist. And guess when this conference was? October 13th. Mm. And so we have the the anniversary of Our Lady uh, of Fatima. And so I talked about this. I talked about Our Lady. Uh, I opened on that Friday night with the talks on, on Mary, who she is. And then following that talk was all talks on the Eucharist. And I had never done those kind of talks before uh, in explaining the connection of Mary and the Eucharist. And I just really felt, wow, this is, this is something we don't talk about more. And sure enough, right after the conference ended, they brought out the largest monstrance I've ever seen in my life. Uh, This monstrance uh, was about five and a half feet tall Wow. And the host was a uh, almost a foot in diameter. Wow! It's very large. You can't tell from the picture. Right. It looks like a normal monstrous, but it's actually yeah. about a foot in diameter. Wow. And 
sure enough, everybody there present saw Our Lady. And it wasn't just one person seeing it or somebody taking a picture and then they developed it and saw it. Everybody saw it as it was happening and the sacristan came out and took the picture mm. and that's the picture that we posted online. And I have never seen a picture of Our Lady in the Eucharist, but I had never given a talk about Our Lady in the Eucharist. Right. And the reason is because people were saying, well, why is Mary on top of the Eucharist? No, Mary's in the heart of Jesus. Mm. And guess what my talk was? One of the four talks I did was on Eucharistic miracles that actually the Eucharist is human heart tissue. And the Eucharist is the heart of Jesus in the flesh. You're eating the actual flesh of Christ in the Eucharist. And Mary's in the heart of Jesus and the heart is the Eucharist. It makes perfect sense. When I first saw the picture, I, you know, I wondered, is this a reflection? But you know, it really, it really can't be. Can you help us uh, understand that yeah. part of it? Because that's, I think that some people said, "Oh, that's just a reflection," but I didn't. That's not what I saw. But you no, know it. it's it's not a reflection, and we need to make this very clear because. To get a reflection that big to fill up the entire monstrance, which was a foot in diameter, right. that would have had to have been five feet in front of the monstrance. Right. Uh, that that statue, and there and there wasn't, but a statue of Mary to be that sized in the in the Eucharist would have had to have been five at the most ten feet from the Eucharist. And the monstrance was in the middle of the uh, front of the altar. And, the and everybody thing... everybody was seeing it. So from different angles, right? Yes. You, yes. you only get that reflection at one angle. Exactly. You know? and and was, it was, was there a statue of Mary anywhere? Or, you know? No. Uh, and I'm not saying that they didn't maybe have one somewhere in the back, but there was none present. There right. was none there during the talk. There was none there during the conference. Um, but you would have had to, if you went up to the monstrous and looked for a reflection, like if she was in the back of the church, a statue, right. it would it would have been this big right. um, in in the reflection of the monstrance. Instead, she filled the whole thing. Yeah, yeah and there, how many people were there at the time, Father, that this had happened? Yeah. yeah, and it, it's it's interesting because I had just left, and I have to laugh because. Our lady said, well, Father Chris probably isn't ready for this yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had just left and there was already a good number of people um, there. And then it went into the morning and they had adoration in the morning. And uh, there was a good number of people there. And then my text started ringing off the hook um, from people who were seeing it there that morning. And then it got shared. And I was just there. I was I was just there, and I, I started laughing. I said, "Okay, Our Lady, what did what did I do wrong not to get this great?" Uh, <laughs> oh, to, but, to, so then, how how long did it, did it go on? I mean, is there any idea how long it actually was seen? Yeah, yeah it, it was it was there for quite a while. All the most part of the morning, uh, right after they celebrated the mass, mm -hmm. uh, and then um, my question was that after I had left was, did anybody contact the bishop? And so we got word that somebody did. So now we're, we're trying to follow up uh, what they did with the host. We're trying to find out what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, did they send the host to the bishop? Did they consume it? Um, did they put it in the tabernacle? So we got some feelers out there trying to find out what, you know, what they ended up doing with the host. Wow. But what do you think, Father? Uh, I mean, the timeliness, October 13th, um, that's also the 50th anniversary of Our Lady of Akita, October 13th. Ah, yep. That's right, because yep. she appeared, and I did a talk on agree. Akita on, um, on our YouTube channel, and I tell you, if you look at that image, it looks like Akita. Is that right? i got to look at it, it again. It looks like Akita. And here in San Francisco, yep, on the 50th anniversary of Our Lady of Akita, 
Yep. I mean, my, my goodness. And then the readings that, that morning were incredible. Uh, you know, uh, call a fast, you know, and, and everything. And here the, the, there was this, the, the patriarchs of Israel were calling the world to a, to a fast at the exact same, right around this exact same time. And, and what is the message of Akita is, you know, similar to Fatima, stop offending our Lord. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, he, our lady can only hold back the hand of our Lord so long. Right. Um, not because our Lord wants in his ordained will to, to chastise us, but in his permissive will, he allows it because we have just gone so wayward. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, that message of Akita, of all the mirroring apparitions I've done, um, is one that really sticks with me because that needs to be a wake-up call for us. Can you go and, into that a little bit, Father? Uh, yeah. Know, why, do you, why do you say that? You know, Akita was in Japan, and it was a, a message of all the Marian apparitions was probably the most of all the messages a warning, um, you know, and Our Lady gave us many warnings, and she's told, you know, she's told us in Fatima, and she's told us in different places about the warnings, but in Akita, um, she gave us probably the most sternest warning of all the Marian apparitions. And, you know, that these were things that we were going to uh, run into everything from natural disasters to suffering um, to famines, uh, that these were all things that were going to happen. Um, and she did it in a very loving way, but in a way that we don't understand how important this is. It was on July 6th, um, 1973, and it ended, as you said, Father, October 13th, 1973. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The three apparitions were in the year of Roe v. Wade. Yes. And um, now, also, most... let me let me interject real quick. Also, the uh, the American Psychological Association removed uh, homosexuality as a disorder on that same ah, year. Ah, that's mm -hmm. right. That same year, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you know, it was approved in 1984 um in japan and carl ratzinger cardinal ratzinger in 1988 um allowed this pastoral letter to be dis, you know to be disseminated amongst the faith and basically if you know the story the statue spoke and and it wept a hundred and hundred and one times yeah. all the way to 1981 and Sister Agnes, um, she was, uh, her order was the handmaids of the Eucharist. Yeah. And so, um, you know, she, it's interesting because she was not a child. A lot of times Mary appears to children. Um, but this statue bled, uh, got the stigmata. And um, it, it really is amazing the timing, the message. Um, you know, that that wound appeared on the inside of the hand of Saint a Sister Agnes yep. um, and bled, causing her a lot of pain. And she heard the voice come from the statue um, that gave warnings to the world. And so we really need to listen to this. It, you know, what I would interject one last time about that is that this October 13th, right? Mm -hmm. And 50th anniversary of Our Lady Akita were... Our Lady said, "Bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal." Right? Yeah. Look what's happening in the, in the synod. Of the synod. Yeah. Our, yeah. The fiftieth anniversary is dead center in the middle of the synod. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Cardinal yeah. against cardinal, bishop against bishop. Yeah. So, yeah, here we are. It's time to. Pray. And, you know, and I remember I did this talk um, on YouTube, and you can look it up if you type in Akita. And my last name, but I remember Mary, you know, it's kind of that similar message to Fatima, but I remember her saying, you know, if, if we do not repent, um, that the father, she, she pointed to the father, um, will inflict, if I remember terrible punishments. And again, it's not because God wants to punish us, right? but if I remember correctly, father Heilman, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but she said that it would be greater than the deluge. Yep. Um, like we've never seen before. Yep. Um, and she said it would spare neither priest 
yep. nor faithful. Right. And that the survivors yep. would, envy um, the would, would, yeah, would, would envy the dead. Yeah. I mean, we got to wake up here. I, I'm not trying to scare anybody, right. but, you know. Um, and then the Holy Land is bombed on Our Lady of Victory, to, what, mm. seven days, six days before. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's just, which could ignite something worldwide because that that's set up just right for, you know, nations to, to, to take sides. It um, is. Yeah. And, and, and remember, she mentioned taking up arms in Akita. And yeah. if you remember, she said um, that the only arms that are available are, are the rosary. She said, the yes. only arms which I, that you will have or that will remain is the rosary and the sign that was left by her son. And so she said at Akita each day to pray the rosary. Now, this is just like Fatima. Yeah. Uh, but she, and what did she say to pray the rosary specifically for? Do you remember? Um, priests and bishops? Yeah. Yes, the Pope. Yeah. yeah. The, the Pope, Pope, priests, and bishops. Yeah. Tell me that's not what in we're the middle to be of the doing. synod. During the synod, yeah. This yeah. is this it is. Sound, a, I mean, it we, it we just sounds really... like com, it sounds like complete coincidence to me, gentlemen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm so glad you're pointing this out because I yeah. didn't even really think about this. Yeah. Um, in enough detail, but what you're pointing out makes absolutely perfect well, it's sense. It's all fresh. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, the, Father, what was the reaction of people, I mean, that you heard or spoke to personally? Was it just kind of laze blase or was it were no, they shocked by no. this? I mean But you know the devil's gonna get into it. And yeah. in fact, again, going back to Fatima, I remember um Mary said that the work of the devil would infiltrate even into the church. Yeah. And that's what Father Heilman just said, so that we'll see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. You know, um, you know, and it even says the priests who venerate me will be scorned. And think about this. What were we doing with Mary in the Eucharist there? We were worshiping Jesus, but we were venerating Mary. And we're getting scorned. We're, yeah. we're getting scorned. Um, well, you know, traditional for, priests are getting uh, hammered right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And, Traditional priests almost identified as a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, another, another part of that, the Akita message was she said that the demon would be especially implacable. With the word always struck me, implacable against consecrated souls. And yeah, look up in, right. implacable basically means relentless. That yeah, and this what she said that the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service yeah. of the right. Lord. Right. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, all everything, and, and as some have said, everything from Akita has happened except... There's one. one the, go ahead. The yep. fire. Yes. That fire would fall from the sky. But the bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal, pressing of priests, the implacable, relentless nature of the demon... Um, so all these different the, the convents are emptying out. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, it, and I, it's not. I mean, I've been talking about a key to myself, you know, for years too, Father. And it's just, it's not a comfortable message to share with people. Right. It never feels good to talk about fire falling from the sky. I mean, who wants to hear that? I got grandkids and kids, and they want lives, you know, that are that are wonderful and peaceful and joyful. And how I many? Who doesn't want that? Yeah. And, and you know. What's interesting is if you read the Bible, how the world will end. Now, we don't know when, but the Bible uses the word conflagration, meaning fire. Mm. Mm. And so is this the wake up call? Um, right. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina 92 years ago that she would help prepare the world for his final coming. That was 92 years ago. And I don't think anybody, if our Lord comes tonight, would be able to say, how come you didn't give us a sign? How come you didn't give us a warning? Yeah, yeah. Here, here's what I think about about a, a warning or, you know, buck up, you know, as a good parent would say to their child, right? Um, 
when did so that happened in October 13, 1973, 50 years ago this October 13th. No other message until October 6, 2019. Hmm. And so you guys are talking about fire. I still am hopeful. I, I think we might go through something bad. I don't know. But but what did Our Lady say? Like Jonah going through Nineveh, mm-hmm. put on ashes and pray a repentant rosary. That's it. That's all she said. Mm-hmm. It was wow. like Jonah. You know, all right. And, and, but what happened in Nineveh? They did it and he relented in punishing them. You know, yeah. so and you know what? It's time, it's time for a call for prayer. Absolutely. And if you notice, the one thing I have noticed about every time Our Lady speaks is the word if. Right. She said it at Fatima. She said it everywhere. She never says, she never speaks without saying the word if. Right. And in Akita, what did she say? If men do not repent. And better themselves. There will be terrible punishment on all humanity. Right. This means, just like Fatima, Mary keeps using the word if, which means this is conditional. And remember, Pope uh, Benedict said, prophecy is not written unchangeably. It's not written in stone. If we heed heaven's warnings, we can avoid this chastisement. Hey, you know what what ha- what happened on October sixth, that same twenty nineteen, the Amazon Synod. That was day one. No kidding. Yep. Mm. And on day two, they brought a an idol, the Pachamama. Pachamama. Yep. Uh, 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 at the base of the altar in Saint Peter's Basilica, which is only a few steps away from the bones of Peter, uh, but it's no. it's right next to the, our Lord. And get this, Father. And um, people have heard me say this before, but on that exact same day, here's what happened. Uh, reports came out that on October 7th uh, to to October 24th, I believe it was, um, there was no cell phone activity indicating that some event, ha- hazardous event happened in the Wuhan lab in, uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So all on October 6th. Wow! Just when, her mess, just when her Jonah-like message comes out, wow! You know, that's that's Our Lady of Akita again, and here we are now at the 50th anniversary while this synod is going on. That everybody's just frightened. What, what's going to come out of that? And but, you know, yeah, because how more prophetic could Our Lady be than pray the Rosary for the Pope, yep. bishops, and priests? Right. Because priests and cardinals will be, and bishops will be against each other. I mean, right. how much more prophetic could you see? And it really ties to even Our Lady of Good Success. I just did a talk on Saturday about modesty um, in the church and how we need to come to Mass wearing proper attire. And what inspired me to do that talk, you know, Our Lady warned in Fatima about war and whatnot. And, you know, what inspired me to do that talk on Saturday about modesty is I, w- I was at this same church and um, I gave a talk. I'm sorry, before I gave the talk, a young lady about 20, 25, 28 years old came in. She had a skin tight shirt on and over her breasts, it said weapons of mass destruction. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable that somebody would walk into a church wearing that shirt. Mm-hmm. And so it inspired me to do the talk on modesty and how interesting that Our Lady of Good Success in 1610 um, to... Uh, uh, a nun in Ecuador would warn that shortly after the middle of the 20th century, things would begin to go awry. When did the sexual revolution happen? Right, right. after the middle of the 20th century. Right. And she, the big thing she pointed out then was the offensive 
attire and the um, the fashion that uh, people would be offending our Lord in the immodesty. She actually called out immodesty wow. um, during that talk, and she brought out Freemasonry too. That um, you know this was this was going to be infiltrating the church, and every time I keep thinking, how is the church? getting so confused right now is it part of that freemasonry effect that that has been allowed to um you know infiltrate i don't know father chris we we've had a lot of talk in the last several months about october and an october convergence and father how and i did several podcasts with some people who were talking about alleged prophecies um although you had some who tied it back to our lady of good success our lady of la salette Certain church-approved mystics, like uh, uh, Marie Julie Jehani, was one. Um, Three days and, of darkness. Yeah, yeah. And so we've got we've got prophecies um, that have that have that have come from people that have been approved, acknowledged by the church formally, and then we have alleged modern-day seers. And I say, you know, keep them at arm's length, you know, until the church makes a decision and such. But a lot was pointing towards October, and some of what was being said was simplified to the. To this point, that October would be the beginning, like the first chapter of many things that would increase and intensify leading up to greater trials and tribulations in coming months, potentially throughout the year and so forth. And then, of course, October 7th, the anniversary of the Battle of Lepanto, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, Our Lady of the Rosary, we had this major attack against the Holy Land. And very quickly now, and within two weeks, we've seen it escalate to where the Pentagon just came out today at the time we record this. On October 23rd, the Pentagon came out and said that any attacks against U.S. troops will be recognized as coming from Iran. Now, Iran, obviously, hold, I'm not going to get into the geopolitics of these things, but Iran obviously is a much bigger player, the state sponsor of Hamas and Hezbollah and so forth. And all that's been very publicly acknowledged. That's nothing that's, I mean, it's all over the, pre the press. They, they know this. Um, but we also have this incident on October 13th and this this miracle of Our Lady in the Eucharist, I personally don't see these things as being coincidental. I know we can't say anything with certain certainty or with, with a certain definitive nature because, I mean, these things, we don't know the mind of God. But it seems awfully unusual that we have these major events happening with the idea of war escalating as quickly as it looks like it is. And now we see something as miraculous as what you experienced out there in San Francisco. All of this, again, anniversary, 50 years, Akita, all these different pieces. I'd kind of like you to, if you don't mind giving us summarization or synopsis of what you think with regards to the times that we're in, the prophecies alleged and approved, um, making sure that the audience realizes that we want to be a voice of reason here and not get caught up in unnecessary sensationalism or drama. However, I will say, I don't know how much more dramatic you can get than the image of the Blessed Mother on the mon over the Eucharist of monstrance that that you just described, God does have a tendency to use a little bit of drama and sensationalism with us when He reaches out to us. But your take, take overall of where you see where we are and what's been talked about in recent months. Well, and you know, it's interesting, and that's a good point because I think we have to listen um, to so much. You know, our the end times are biblical. And again, I've done many talks on those. Um, you know, the, the end times um, is something that we have to understand um, a little bit better than the average Catholic does. Um, and one of the things that I'm saying that I think is happening right now is that final battle between God and Satan, because we know that the... Um, uh, words to Lucy, Lucia at Fatima uh, from the Cardinal, where that before the end of God's final battle between Satan and God would be over marriage in the family. Mm -hmm. And what are we seeing right now? We're seeing that. Now, if you remember the five signs in the Bible before the end times, these are biblical. Nobody, nobody can accuse me of being way out there or being crazy conspiracy, conspiracy theorists. There are five signs in the Bible, clear as day, that have to happen before the end times. One is the gospel will be preached to the whole world. 
This is Matthew 25. Now, what's happened since COVID? The internet has exploded. That's how I found you guys. Hmm. It's like you you have an, a new reach now digitally right. around the whole world. Okay. Um, so God is now allowing the gospel to be breached almost everywhere that hmm. we never reached before. You know, I've gotten letters from all over the world of places we never heard of divine mercy before. I, I said before, I've gotten letters from just about all countries now except North Korea. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and the, the next one is the great apostasy. I mean, are we not seeing the great apostasy mm -hmm. right now? I mean, we, we, we are totally seeing the great apostasy. Yeah. Um, a turning away from the faith. Um, you know, um, it really, really is. Now, here's the other three. Um, there's going to be, the Bible says, a, a universal conversion of the Jews to Jesus Christ. Now, what's happening in Israel could be preparing, you know, God can convert Israel overnight. He doesn't need, you know, he doesn't have to wait for a thousand years before we do it person by person. He could do it instantly, um, you know, with a signal grace, but the, the conversion of the Jews and what what I believe is happening is this whole issue with Israel is going to bring an awareness to their role, the role of the Jews, because then the fourth sign is the revelation of the Antichrist, which I'll be talking about this coming Saturday. And let me tell you, the Antichrist is a very interesting topic. It's biblical. Um, because is this person alive today? Well, priests like James Blunt have said it's been revealed to him by God. I, I don't know. Um, but the fifth and final sign is tribulation, both natural and man-made. And now we're starting to see that. Mm. And, and what's interesting is the Bible does not give that in order. So let's suppose the Bible's not being preached around the world. We've seen that. The great apostasy, we've seen that. What about the Antichrist? It says revelation of the Antichrist. What if that's already happened through people like Father James Blunt? I, again, I don't know. The tribulation, both natural and man-made, we're really seeing that. That really only leaves the conversion to the Jews. And now with everything that's going on in Israel, you got to wonder if we're going to see that. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about this is, remember, we can't forget... Mary said her, her heart will triumph first. And that will usher in a time of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so I always do in my, in my talks, um, you know, the important part of not being afraid. Because this is a time that God is going to bring Our Lady. And so... Really, when you boil it down, I think, Doug, you just mentioned about all the different things you're talking about. Look at the order. Here's the order. If you want to look at the order of the saints, it's chastisement, then the warning or the illumination of conscience. I kind of use them synonymously. Right. The Antichrist, then the three days of darkness, but then an era of peace, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, and then the final coming, the second coming of Christ. Now, this, if you believe the saints going from chastisement to the warning, which is the illumination of conscience to the Antichrist, the three days of darkness, many would look at that and say, okay, we're, we're in the chastisement now. But next after that would come the warning or the illumination of conscience. And what's been going on? It is, we have been given by our Lord a chance to see ourselves the way God sees us. I'm telling you, we are going to have an illumination of conscience. Mm. I, I fully believe that. Yeah. I fully believe that. And then will come the Antichrist. Then the three days of darkness. Then the era of peace through the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And then the second coming of Christ. Father, um, um, I, I think all of us try to see what God's signaling with uh, in our time. And, and see what you think about this. This is the way my brain worked on this. We have Father Carlos Martins going, going around the nation right now with the arm of St. Jude, just at a time where people are just kind of giving up. 
you know, it, that, that this is just way beyond anything that can be done. And so they're giving up. So you have the patron saint of impossible causes. Impossible causes. Yeah, that's yeah. being highlighted in this particular year. Okay. Now, the feast day is October 28th. I did a little count. Uh, the, the days between October 28th and the Feast of the Immaculate Conception are 40 days. So I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna be announcing this real soon in the next few days here, but I'm gonna ask us all to pray for these 40 days. But mm -hmm. what are we doing? We're asking the the patron saint of a possible causes to be with us, but we're heading to the Immaculate Conception. And Father, I told you before we started that I watched one of the most amazing talks I've ever seen in my life that you gave on July 2nd of last year. Um, and one of the things you talked about is the the nation, the America, w was dedicated to the Mecca conception. And even, can you tell us about the Mississippi River too? But but maybe you, the significance, may, maybe possibly this year, especially, Father, of that feast state? Uh, I don't know. Can, can, can I get your... Yeah, in, in fact, a lot of people don't um, understand that our history um, of our nation is so wrapped up in the essence of Our Lady that they changed the name of the Mississippi River to the Mississippi River. But before that was the River of the Immaculate Conception. That's so and weird. yeah, and so the I mean, when you tie into this, Our Lady um, of America, when was the Declaration of Independence actually signed? It was ratified on July 4th, but when was it signed? It was signed on July 2nd. And so this whole connection um, that people don't understand is really, really powerful. And it's at the heart of our nation um, and the heart of our country that we need to turn back to God. And remember, Mary said, prophecy is not irrevocably set. This is all a warning for right. us to be able to turn back to God if we would just listen. You know, it, it, it really is not that hard our lord has given us the blueprint right. <laughs> and we still don't want to listen but america was uh i'm using the word dedicated because of the more to the immaculate conception right yes yeah the u.s congress um actually declared freedom from great britain on july 2nd yep and they voted for independence on july 2nd and, you know, the signing and we had the uh, Catholic, uh, the, the cousin of our first bishop out of Baltimore. But once it was approved, then the Declaration of Independence, that document on July 4th, was sent uh, to print. And they, they printed, I think, if I mentioned in the talk, like 200 copies or something. Right. And, and that started really when it was official. That became when it was official. And Our Lady was behind all this. She's the patroness of the United States since 1847. And, and so in 1776, people celebrated the Feast of the Immaculate Conception even before 1776. You know, I'm from Michigan. There's a great explorer there, Father Marquette. And he was the one that placed the Immaculate Conception on the name of the Mississippi River under her protection and named it the Immaculate Conception River. And so this is, that title became the patroness of the United States. And, um, you know, 15 years after the birth of the United States, the Holy See established um, the Diocese of Baltimore, which included the 13 colonies with the first bishop of John Carroll, whose cousin signed the Declaration of, or the um, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and um, so the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Catholic Church are behind all this. And in 1846, Mary, under that title, became patroness of the United States, and that was sent to the Holy See. And get a load of this, Father Heilman, 
it was approved on July 2nd, 1847. Wow. Wow. And so um, that, and it was right before the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's, it's so powerful, these connections um, that, you know, wow, um, how do we miss this? You know, um, pray to our patroness uh, of the United States. She's, she's playing a central role in all the ways we just got done talking about. So then why would somebody uh, take exception that our our Lord would have her in that image yes. on the Holy Eucharist? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? I mean, maybe he's pointing to her, you know, maybe he's accentuating. I don't know. But, well, uh, I, I love this example. Do you know when our Lord, the, what are the last, what is the last action he did on this earth? The last thing our Lord did on this earth give, give was her. give the gift of his mother. Yep. Now, here's Behold what's fascinating. Jesus told John, this is who John represented Peter. all disciples, to take her into his heart. I'm sorry, into her home. That's a euphemism. That's John right there. For taking her into your heart. Mm. Now, what is Jesus showing yep. us by having Mary in the Eucharist? I just did the talk, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, in San Francisco about Eucharistic miracles. Wow. And what's fascinating about Eucharistic miracles on the ones that are approved, like the Buenos Aires is the one I specifically talked about from 1996. They tested the Eucharist of the Eucharistic miracle and it came back human heart tissue. Right. So what is our Lord saying by having Mary's image on the Eucharist? Oh, you Catholics are saying that she's, she's on top of Jesus. She's greater than Jesus. No. What Jesus is saying, just what he said on the cross, take her into your heart. Mm. I did. Here's Mary in my heart. Well, wait a minute, Father. How's that the heart of Jesus? The Eucharist tested in every Eucharistic approved miracle of the um, Eucharistic miracles shows it is human heart tissue of somebody whose heart was under severe stress. And so our Lord, in my opinion, is showing Our Lady in his heart to say, don't be afraid to take her into your heart, which in the euphemism means take her into your home. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this is what Jesus said to do from the cross. Yep. I mean, this is amazing. Amazing. Father, the, the reaction that people gave, uh, obviously a lot of them were stunned. Um, and I think a key point to remember, and you've, you've said this several times, but just to make it abundantly clear to people is, this is the power of God working this isn't Our Lady, because every time she comes into the world, she's being sent by her son. The message is from her son. It's from heaven. Yeah. And I, I just think, I think it was Father Blunt when we had him on the podcast at one time, he he made the statement that the, the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady and the Sacred Heart of Jesus are in perfect union. They mm -hmm. are in perfect union. You can't separate them at all. And I, I, I was thinking about that as you were saying, that this is Jesus saying, look, I've taken her into my heart. There's this perfect union between the two. Um, has there been any fallout or feedback negatively that you have found or discovered or heard? Um, this is going to throw people for a loop. And, and I want to say this too, before you comment, I just, I hope and pray that people do not take this lightly. I just, I don't look at this situation, especially on the day that it happened in the month that's going on, the anniversary of Akita, the times that the world is living in right now. I just don't see when we hear about these types of miracles, see these types of miracles, or hear about statues that weep like Akita, or for example, um, it was reported uh, starting on October 6th through to at least the 20th. I'm not sure if it's still going on. There's an image in the Philippines of Our Lady of Revelation, I believe is the title. And that painting has been weeping. Um, I was just in the Philippines this summer and went to the chapel of weeping um, statues. I never saw anything like it in my life. Mm. I, I took video. I took pictures. Every single statue, and there were hundreds inside this chapel, were weeping oil. 
Wow. And you could see the oil dripping. It's not wow. like you would put oil and then it would just dry up. The oil was freshly dripping from the statues. I never saw anything like it in my so, life. So then with a the, with the message like that, Father, of weeping statues, the Blessed Mother's image over the over the Eucharist and the monstrance, I mean, what what would you say to the audience, to any of us, to all of us, about how serious and significant these events are in these times? Yeah, and you you also asked a good question. You said, has there been any negative yeah. fallout? And, and, you know, actually, yes, a little, but I think it's very significant. What does Satan want to do? He wants to cause confusion. Mm. So he's not going to allow this without causing some kind of confusion. Now, here's the negative feedback we've been getting. Um, we've been getting the negative feedback that this is demonic because it's in the gospel. Yeah. And, so and Jesus it, performs a miracle. And it's by Beelzebul that he did that. Yes. And Christ, yeah, you're exactly right. Christ has been accused of this since the day he's, he yeah. walked the earth. But what I find interesting is the attacks that we get are that this is demonic. This is of Satan. And then they'll go so far as to say all Marian apparitions of our Satan are of Satan. And, and my answer is, well, if that's the case, then praise be to God, because Satan has become a Christian. Because <laughs> every message in an approved apparition of Mary, be it Lourdes, La Salette, Akita, Fatima, is only focused on her son. Yeah. And they are focused on leading people back to her son. Yeah. Now, if the message that that she gives us in Akita is of Satan, I'm sorry, is um is is not of heaven, then praise be to God, as I said, because that means Satan is is preaching Christian, return to Christ, mm. stop offending him, um, repent. Yeah. pray and 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 worship God and put God number one. Well, wow, if if that's of Satan, Satan's become a Christian. Now obviously yeah. we know that's not the case, but right. but facetiously, I think I was able to prove the point to the people that you can't have that kind of message be from Satan. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's not it's it's not possible. And so the, the the message that Mary gives in all these apparitions is one of focus on Christ. It's not a focus on herself. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a focus on leading people to Jesus. It's kind of like the other negative feedback we got is that famous example: Christ is the only mediator between God and man, mm -hmm. and therefore you are satanic. Well, let's look at that. In Timothy, Paul does say this, but we're not claiming Mary's a mediator between the Father and man. Only Jesus is a mediator between Father and man. Mary leads you to her son, right. who leads you to the Father. Right. Intercession and mediation are different. Right. Right. They're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mary is not the one mediator. Mary is an intercessor to lead you to her son, who is the only way to the father. So mm -hmm. basically, in, in fact, the Greek that's written for one mediator is not monos, which would mean no possible any other way for any other way of mediation. It uses the word eis, E-I-S, which means Christ is the first in a series. He's the main mediator. He is the mediator, but sub-mediators are, under the word ES, are allowed. Because what do you do when I pray for you? I'm, I'm mediating. I'm interceding, even though they're different. I, I'm interceding, which leads you to Christ, which then he mediates us to the Father. Mm -hmm. And so, no, Mary doesn't lead us to the Father. Jesus does. Mm -hmm. Well, what does Mary do then? She leads you to Jesus. Kind of kind of like, how did Peter find Jesus? His brother, Andrew. Well, then Andrew was an intercessor. He was a mediator. Right, right. Because he took, put, took Peter to Jesus. 
Now, Peter doesn't take us to God the Father, only Jesus did. But Peter, Andrew took Peter to Jesus. Right. And so what do we do by intercession? We take people to Jesus right. so Jesus can take us to the Father. What's yeah. your spidey sense, Father, um, uh, better put, what's the Holy Spirit telling you? Uh, do you think there's going to be more manifestations of the supernatural uh, with what's going on in the world and and where we're at at this point in history, more miracles? Uh, is that? Yeah, is I, and I think... I think we're approaching the the a warning, the illumination of conscience, and the three days of darkness. And do you know the three days of darkness is biblical? Um, people don't realize that it's 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 it happened in Egypt, one of the ten plagues, and it doesn't say it just darkness fell over the land. It says darkness fell over the land for three days, mm -hmm. and so there is a precedent about three days of darkness. And there is a precedent that God has done it before. Well, if he's done it before, why wouldn't he allow it? And Faustina talks that shortly before the end, darkness will overcome the, the land and the only light will be a cross in the sky from which light will come from the wounds of where Christ's hands and feet. Hmm. And so, yes, to answer your question, I do believe there will be more manifestation because our Lord is going to give everybody a huge chance yep. to see themselves as God sees us. That's the illumination of conscience right. yeah. and, the, and the warning. And then, and then it says many will drop dead just from the fear of seeing their souls the way that their souls are. Yeah. And, then, and then for them, then will come the Antichrist. He'll swipe, sweep away many. And then what's left is the remnant. And the remnant will then have to go through the final test of the days of darkness, three days of darkness, and then will come the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. So I believe we're getting there. I really, really do. I, I believe it's coming. Our Lord has always led us through prophecy. And that way, nobody could ever say, you never guided us. You never helped us. You never gave us a warning. Wow. He's, he's given us plenty um, to, to wake up. Well, and, that, and that's where, you know, back to that point about the weeping statues and weeping images. And I, di I didn't know that there was a, a chapel that had as many as you just described there. Unbelievable. Father. I've yeah. seen a couple, you know, at a Marian conference in Petoskey, Michigan, there was an image and it was it was in, in glass and you couldn't. I was up there. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was weeping oil from the eyes. And and so we've got these images and and they're fantastic in the true sense of the word. They're they're just out of the ordinary. They're they're and you can't explain that how these things could be happening this way. It's like the many people that are seeing the miracle of the sun. They're seeing it with their eyes, and you know, and, and it's happening more and more. And you know, so many people are saying, you know, priests like yourselves that are involved in these types of you know, um, conversations, I should say, um, are saying that they're seeing and hearing the same thing for many people, an increase of signs and wonders, as well as an increase of just unbelievable conversions that are happening too among some people like atheists and so forth. Um, so with regards to the images, do you think that there is a key significance behind weeping images or is it, I mean, or is it just, I mean, not to be, you know, downplay it, but simply that the Blessed Mother is showing us her tears because of the gravity of the situation or your thoughts on, on the images and the weeping? Our Lady of Sorrows is imperative right now. Yep. Um, and I tell you, that visit to that chapel in the Philippines um, where I saw every single statue, and in fact, they had little uh, trays underneath each statue, either the eyes or underneath the arms of Mary's hands were outstretched because the oil was dripping from each of the fingers. Yep. And the time I was there, I watched these little saucers being filled with oil. It, it's impossible that that could happen without somebody coming and pouring the oil onto the statue. And so I became a believer instantly and the fact that God allows these to happen to wake us up um, that for some who are skeptical or they're not sure, is this really real? When you see that oil coming from 250 statues in one chapel, 
and they were all weeping at the same time, oozing oil, tears coming down Our Lady. I really occurred that that is a sign of our Blessed Mother. She is weeping for this world at this time because we've never been in such darkness. Remember, Pius XII said, mankind is more sinful now today than he was even at the time of the flood. And that was back in the 50s. What in the world would he say about today? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. So uh, to answer your question, I, I became an instant believer mm. that, that God is working through these images to see the tears of the, of, of the sorrows of Mary. It, 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 she weeps for us because we are her children. And what mother does not weep for her children? Yeah, it makes me think of the last, some of the last words that she mentioned in that final apparition on October 13th in Akita, 1973, the anniversary of the miracle of the sun and so many other October 13th key dates over the years. And she says that the cause of my great sadness is the loss of so many souls. Exactly. And I would think that we've seen these manifestations, signs and wonders of weeping statues and images all over. How does that not say exactly what you just said, Father? She's and weeping. We have souls. an image hanging in the Association of Marian Helpers. Check this out. Giant, full-size, six-foot image of divine mercy. And the eyes wept, and a trail of oil went all the way down the image and collected at the bottom of the image. And in white was written, Jesus, I trust in you. And all of the oil fell on the word trust and discolored the word trust. So oh. all the other words were bright white, but trust was discolored by the oil. And what did Jesus say to St. Faustina that pained him more during his passion than anything else mm. was not our sins, but our lack of trust. And, and what is lack of trust? Wow. It's lack of belief in yeah. the supernatural power of God, right? And I believe, here we go back to October 13th of this year, the gospel is the one where Jesus says, when a strong man fully armed guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied. And then it would be St. Paul in Ephesians that say, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full mm -hmm. armor of God, right? Right. So what, what, how has Satan done the damage that he's done in our church over the last hundred years? He took away our armor. He took away our belief in the supernatural power of God. Now we have churches emptying out, and the few, many who remain are treating Jesus like a potato chip. And, and so it, here we are. We're weak. We're supernaturally weak. And the devil is just, I, I keep saying he, he's laughing because it's so easy. He's it just is. waltzing in right now. And, and, and so, and, go ahead. No, no. And, and, and you're absolutely right because I've had so many people come up to me, Father, why are you so, um, so uh, worked up over this? Because anybody knows, sees my passion. I, I just, I, I, I get so passionate over this. And they say, God wins in the end. You know, God wins. Well, yes, that's true. We won World War II. By 1943, we knew we were going to win the war. In 1944, at the beginning of 1945, it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to win the war. But why did they continue fighting? To minimize the casualties. Yep, the collateral damage. The collateral damage, which we, that's what we're fighting for right now. Right. Yes, God, God wins the war. But my job and yeah. your job as a priest and Doug's job as host is you spread this message, yep. the message that you've been doing with Grace Force. And our job is to minimize the casualties, the lost yeah. souls. Yeah, God so, wins in the end, but I still care that my brother yes. and my neighbor next door gets yes. to heaven. You know? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and that's why we fight this fight. Fight, In 1945, yeah. my uncle got his arm, great uncle, my dad's, my dad's uncle, my great uncle, 
got his arm blown off by a German mortar cannon three days before the end of the war. Wow. Wow. What was he fighting for? They knew that the war was going to be won. Right. They were fighting to save the remaining lives, yep. to, mm -hmm. to minimize the remaining casualties. Yep. We are fighting towards the end of the war. God is going to win. We know this. But I tell you, my job, your job is what you just said, to, to save our brothers. Now, we don't save them. God saves them. But God gives us the opportunity through the rosary, through the church, through the grace of the sacraments to be able to save souls. Now, it's not we saving, God saves, but our job is to minimize these casualties. And I'll tell you what, right now, that's why Mary is weeping. She mm -hmm. sees the casualties of yes. the lost yes. souls. Well, Father, our, I think our time is up. Gosh, this was great. We hope to have you back soon. Absolutely. And, uh, the, and let's pray that God brings lots of miracles and lots of conversions and we get the same end that the Ninevites got, right? Mm -hmm. um, praise God for Mary, too, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put on ashes, pray to re repent and rosary. Please, everyone, you know, humble yourself before the God. Go to confession. Uh, stay as close to you can to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Father, could you end with a little prayer? For us. Yeah, absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to be able to aid an ailing world through the blood and water of your divine mercy. Wash us clean of all sin and punishment. Wrap the mantle of Mary around us and give us the strength of perseverance that not only us be saved, but our brothers. And we are saved through trusting you. And please give all those listening, all those watching this Grace Force program, the ability to cooperate with your grace and to respond in this, this time of such darkness with a ray of light. And we ask this through Christ our Lord, and we bless you all, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Father. Yeah, thank you, Father. This was great. God bless you guys, and keep up the good work.